Welcome back to video 9, the third in our quantum finance series. In the previous sessions, we explored quantum portfolio analysis using QAOA and option pricing with quantum Monte Carlo methods and QAE. Check out qubit-lab.ch. Today, we turn to quantum machine learning, or QML, applied to the financial use case of credit card fraud detection. The objective is to identify fraudulent transactions the moment they occur based on available features. First, we'll take a quick look at the general challenge of fraud detection. Then, we'll explore the basics of how a quantum neural network is structured and how it works. After that, we'll dive into a concrete Python use case and its results. Finally, we'll look at other QML applications and discuss the potential for quantum advantage in this field. Let's start with credit card fraud detection in general. Machine learning is already widely used in this field, often relying on deep neural networks or their variants. When a potential fraud is detected, the transaction may be paused or cancelled, while a real-time process, whether automated or handled by a fraud center agent, receives the alert and takes action, typically by contacting the cardholder to confirm whether the transaction is legitimate. I have personally experienced this, receiving such calls shortly after moving to Sao Paulo as an expat. The challenge is clear. The vast majority of transactions are legitimate. While only a tiny fraction are fraudulent, agents must act within seconds, not minutes. Too many false alarms raise costs and frustrate customers while too few detections increase losses from fraudulent transactions. This makes fraud detection a real-world use case with a crystal clear return on investment. The faster and more efficient the solution, the lower the fraud losses, the lower the cost of fraud prevention measures, and the higher the client satisfaction. Clients are often grateful for timely interventions, even when the alert turns out to be a false alarm as long as the confirmation is quick and polite. When I was in Brazil, I was struck by the lightning fast response of my credit card company aiming to protect me from potential fraud. Even though it turned out not to be fraud, their proactive care made me feel secure enough to share the experience with colleague, a strong example of how good fraud protection drives positive referrals. So, how can we build such systems with quantum machine learning? Let's first revisit how a classical neural network resolves the issue. This is meanwhile common practice in finance. With classical machine learning, you can train a neural network, for instance, a straightforward multi-layer perceptron to detect fraud cases based on training samples, classified as fraud and non-fraud. Such a multi-layer perceptron is a feed-forward network of neurons. Each neuron takes a weighted sum of its inputs and passes the result through a nonlinear activation function, such as ReLU or Sigmoid. These nonlinearities allow the network to model complex nonlinear decision boundaries. The layers are trained by adjusting the weights via backpropagation so that the final layer's outputs match the desired labels. This is done entirely on classical hardware and uses purely real-valued arithmetic. A quantum neural network, on the other hand, is first of all a trainable quantum circuit. It consists of two blocks, the static encoder and the trainable ansatz block. In the encoder block, the classical features are first encoded into a quantum state. Quantum gates translate the input values into rotations of qubits setting up the initial quantum state for processing. This step effectively converts numerical data into a rich quantum representation, ensuring the model has the right foundation before moving on to the ansatz block. Next comes the ansatz block, a parameterized quantum circuit made of adjustable single qubit rotations and entangling gates. These gates create superposition and entanglement giving the QNN the ability to represent complex relationships within the data. The result is a quantum state in a Hilbert space that grows exponentially with the number of qubits. Finally, designated output qubits are measured to produce the result of the analysis. The circuit parameters in the ansatz block play the role of weights. During training, 
A classical optimizer such as Adam updates these parameters to minimize a loss function based on measurement outcomes with gradients computed using the parameter shift rule rather than standard backpropagation. Unlike classical networks, there is no explicit activation function. The non-linear behavior arises from quantum interference and measurement probabilities. Because a QNN leverages superposition and entanglement, it represents certain functions more efficiently than a classical network, capturing global correlations that would otherwise require many classical layers to approximate. In short, a classical multilayer perceptron propagates information through layers of weighted sums and non-linear activations, while a QNN layer is a quantum circuit where information is encoded as quantum states and processed through parameterized and optimized rotations and entangling gates. The training loop in a QNN is hybrid. Classical software iteratively updates the quantum circuit parameters based on measurement outcomes rather than relying entirely on classical backpropagation. Now, let's map our knowledge from a classical neural network to a QNN. First, data normalization. In a classical approach, you may normalize the data. In a QNN setup, normalization is required, for example, to a range of from zero up to pi in the common angle encoding scheme. Angle encoding means that each feature value is encoded as a rotation of the qubit state vector, which defines the specific range. Second, splitting the data. In both approaches, you split into training and test sets. Train on one part and test on the other. Third, encoding. A QNN requires explicit encoding using an encoder block, the initial part of the circuit that configures the qubit state vectors. This can be done as pure angle or amplitude encoding, as a mixture such as in the ZZ feature map circuit or in a custom design. Fourth, architecture. Between encoding and measurement, the network is defined by a quantum circuit with optimizable parameters. One example is the two local approach provided by Qiskit. Fifth, the output layer. In a QNN, this is simply the measurement of the qubits with no additional logic required. Sixth, training. The QNN is trained through a hybrid mechanism that uses a classical optimizer and repeated evaluation of the quantum circuit. A loss function is minimized and gradients are calculated to adjust the parameters at each step. A seventh, tuning. Just like a classical neural network, a QNN can be tuned by adjusting the number of layers or repetitions, the encoding method, or optimizer parameters such as the learning rate. So as you can see, many aspects are similar between classical neural networks and QNNs, while others require rethinking. It is a very exciting area, still in the early stages of discovery. I believe we cannot yet imagine all the new ideas that will emerge with this approach, and I look forward to seeing them. But now, after all this theory, let us switch to our real case of fraud detection in credit card transactions and see how this is applied in practice. To train a neural network, classical as well as quantum, in classifying samples, we need data, ideally lots of data and labeled. We will use real life data as provided by European cardholders for a specific Kaggle case. The data set contains 285,000 transactions, of which 492 are classified as fraud cases. The data has already been condensed using principal component analysis. There remain 28 features plus transaction time, amount and class. As the data set is highly imbalanced, we define a balanced subset of 984 transaction containing the same number of fraud and legitimate transactions. We then will use 80% of the subset for training and 20% for testing the results. Because quantum simulations on average hardware are very time consuming, we have to restrict ourselves to the top five of the features, which explains 22% of the sample variance. This is not full coverage, but as a prototype proof of concept, far from a scaled production application, it is sufficient to demonstrate the approach. We will see how far we get with these limitations. You do find all the Python code in a Jupyter notebook on the Qubit Lab homepage, qubitlab.ch. Have a look. To 
to analyze the results, we will use the usual confusion matrix for such classifications. From the perspective of the fraud cases, class one, it shows true positives, predicted fraud in real fraud cases, false positives, predicted fraud, but it was not fraud, false negatives and true negatives the other way around. Based on that, we calculate the values for precision, the percentage of false alarms and recall, the percentage of missed fraud cases. What we actually want are high values for both precision and recall, meaning few false alarms and few missed frauds. Now let us look at the actual results of our experiment. After about 10 hours of training, the QNN delivered good performance, even though we captured only 22% of the PCA variance with our five features. From the perspective of class one, the fraud cases, precision was 100%, so every fraud flagged was real. Recall reached 72%, meaning nearly three out of four fraud cases were detected. Overall, the model achieved an F1 score of 0.86, which is a very encouraging result given the limited feature coverage in this proof of concept. In a production setting, the key next step would be to train on more features, which are essential to capture the full complexity of fraud patterns. The 10 hours of training reflect the heavy overhead of running a quantum simulator which grows exponentially with the number of qubits. On real quantum hardware, each circuit execution is much faster, so training times could eventually come down significantly once devices with enough stable qubits are available. And even before that, advances such as penny lane integration and specialized GPU support are making hybrid quantum classical training loops faster and more efficient. In my opinion, this is an encouraging outcome, and I look forward to seeing QML develop not only in fraud detection, but also in many other fields. Our fraud detection QNN was just one example of many possible designs for a quantum network. Just like classical machine learning has developed into a variety of architectures, convolutional neural networks, CNNs, recurrent neural networks, RNNs, and graph neural networks, GNNs. The quantum world mirrors this diversity. Quantum neural networks come in different flavors. Variational classifiers bring quantum-enhanced feature encoding, already tested for fraud detection. Convolutional QNNs reduce parameters while classifying quantum states. Graph QNNs excel at molecule and network problems. Recurrent QNNs capture temporal patterns in finance and other sequential data. And hybrid QNNs combine the strengths of classical and quantum models for versatile tasks. This naturally leads us to the key question, where can these designs deliver true quantum advantage? When we talk about quantum advantage in QNNs, it's important to separate what's already validated from what's still potential or under active research. There are four main points to consider. First, rich representations, superposition and entanglement allow QNNs to capture complex patterns with fewer resources. This has already been validated in theory and in small scale experiments. For example, in the work of Havlicek and of Kong, Choi and Lukin in Nature Physics. Second, Potential speed-up. In certain problem classes, QNNs may achieve exponential efficiency gains. Recent results from Lewis, Gilboa and McLean demonstrate such an advantage for learning specific types of neural networks. Third, NISC practicality. Hybrid training with classical optimizers makes QNNs usable on today's near-term hardware, though this is more about feasibility than a true advantage. And finally, the research frontier. Quantum advantage remains problem specific and much work is still underway to determine exactly where QNNs will outperform classical methods. All right, that's it for this session. Our third video diving into practical applications of quantum computing in finance. Thanks for sticking with me to the end. I'd love to hear your thoughts or questions, so feel free to leave a comment or send feedback. And don't forget to visit qubitlab.ch that's qubit-lab.ch, where you'll find all the videos in this series along with Colab notebooks, Python code, and hands-on resources. 
Thanks again for watching. I hope you're starting to feel that unique quantum vibe. See you in the next video where we'll continue exploring how quantum computing is shaping the future of finance and beyond. Until then, take care and enjoy the quantum journey.